As son, you're always trying to impress your father. He was known to be a great running back, uh, extremely fast on the field. So he had like a reputation. He was a boxer and he was known to be uh, a great athlete. He was athlete of the week. If you ever make athlete of the week, you get this uh, bronze kind of plaque in your name, memorializing the fact that you made athlete of the week, which is kind of hard in Bergen County, New Jersey, where you have a lot of great athletes come out of. So, you know, every time I pass through the hallway, you see that up there. I had to try to live up to that. He was the father who would be at every sporting event for me. By day, he's fighting criminals. At night, he's home playing in the backyard. Catch with me. Courtney. Hey. Three, one, two, three. Don't get carried away. I was told he was going to ask me out. And he did. And we were in ninth grade. And I told my girlfriend, that's the boy I'm going to marry. I fell in love with him because he always opened the door, shut the door. Everything you could ask for in a gentleman. And uh, that's what he, he treat me like a lady. Jessica. He was very hands-on. Uh, when he was there, when we knew he was there, he was at our games, cheering, you know, in the stands, coaching us, yelling at us because we did something wrong and, you know, what we needed to do to correct it. When he was in Yemen, I had a father-daughter dance. I didn't think he was going to come. However, he made sure he was there in time, no sleep, the longest flight of his life, and we had an amazing night. He danced all night with me. We brought my sister Tara, so I wasn't the only one without my dad there. I believe the first day I met Lenny was at a bank robbery. I'm waiting in front of the bank and I see a guy pull up in a truck and get out of the car and just kind of walk across 42nd Street. And it looked to me like he was a cowboy from Texas. He didn't walk like a guy from New York. And I said, this guy's a little bit different. My father was dedicated. You know, he was dedicated to his job. He was dedicated to his family uh, as a husband and a father. He was dedicated to the fire department as a volunteer firefighter. I remember one time Lenny was so wrapped up in a case that he, uh, he stopped right away and says, oh, I've got to call Joanne. He says, it's our anniversary. So he, he comes back after he calls Joanne. He's just shaking his head. I got to go. He says, no, well, it's not our anniversary. He was just so wrapped up in it. He lost track of time. And it was just, you know, he called himself a dumbass. He goes, geez, I thought it was my anniversary. So that was Lenny. The night before, we were going to bed, and Lenny just kept saying how much he loved me, and which he always told me, and how much he could not have done if I wasn't there for him. And um, it was different. The tone was different. It was just different than all the other times, to the point where I was like, OK, what's going on? I said, um, who is she, jokingly? And he goes, no. He goes, I just want you to know how much I love you and that I couldn't have done anything I have done without you. Yeah, I actually was, was on the phone with uh, an agent from the squad who had just retired. And he was at one of the buildings, uh, you know, within eyesight of the, uh, the Trade Center. And during that conversation, we could actually feel some vibration, if you will. And we both said, what the, what the heck was that? Did you, did you feel or hear that? And, he goes, yeah, hold on a second. And uh, he says, he's looking out the window and he said, it looks like there's a ticker tape parade going on. You know, I says, what are you talking about? And it was at that point then that we started to hear something about a plane striking the tower. And at about the same time, you know, Lenny on the radio uh, saying that he's on his way, you know, down the West Side Highway coming, uh, coming into work and he can see smoke coming from one of the towers and he was gonna go down to take a look to see exactly what was going on. The question, was during the course of the day, where, where are our guys, where are our people, and are they okay? He had maintained very good radio communications relative to the situation. You do see him talking on the radio on the French filmmaker's video. 
One of the things that stood out for me was I had never seen a look on his face like that before. And it wasn't fear, it was concern. He, the look of his face was, this is bad and we've got to get going. And as the, as the, the, the triage team there dispersed this group of firefighters, I guess, to, to see if what type of rescue could be uh, facilitated, he went with them. felt that and we knew he wouldn't extract himself from the situation and we couldn't get to him. What he did that day was he said, I have a wife and children that could be in here and I would expect people like us to try to help them. He didn't have to be there, but I think for sure he, uh, he, he, he stayed there to try to save as many lives as he possibly could on a day where he knew we, were, we, we had lost, the fight was over. Now it's a question of how many people are gonna die and how many people can we help? And that's, that's what he did. Zebra 2-4 from Zebra 19. said they put him down down there and my first thought was it doesn't surprise me to be quite frank with you yeah sorry I didn't expect this I can see him at the light you know that we would turn off on huh? That's where he would want to be. My mom had told me, she's like, they can't, they can't find your dad. There's just no call. I mean, eventually I had a realization that after no call, that, yeah, you're busy, but at some point you're gonna give a call to your wife, let her know you're okay. Uh, that call never came and so, you know, bye. 11 o'clock, 11 p.m., I knew, I pretty much had a realization that, you know, that he was in the tower and that he wasn't coming home. In Ridgefield Park, Marines, FBI agents, and volunteer firefighters bid farewell to one of their own, 
FBI agent and father of four, Lenny Hatton. It's a tragic loss to the town, to our department. We're going to miss him. An emotional FBI director, Robert Mueller, offered something else to the families after attending Lenny Hatton's funeral. Those who are responsible for it will, uh, will see justice. It was almost empowering to see how one person can have such a, a ripple effect. And my father died doing what he loved. And not many people can do that. We lost our father, but there's children who, you know, mom, father, grandparents, they're, they're still living because of my dad. You know, they can, sorry. They can go to like their games, um, proms, all that. I miss my friend. I miss my husband. He was my life. He was my soulmate. He was, he was my everything. I do think about, you know, if I'm ever uh, in a similar situation, and, uh, and I would do exactly the same thing. I don't think you're thinking about your life. I think you're thinking about, you know, doing what you've been trained to do. You don't run from it. You know, you just meet it head on. And, and like he did, you know, you go down fighting. And that's exactly what I would do. Through such tragedy, so much good can come out of it. And I count my blessings. I live my life for my children. And through my grandchildren. And through them, I'm living life with him. Because <laughs> there's so much like him. <laughs>